that we've seen so far? I think it's just after 10, so we might kick off officially. Um, we've got control of the muting as well, so we'll just make sure everybody's muted when there's somebody who's talking. But through the question and answer time, if you need to talk, you can just unmute yourself as well. Um, and if we need to, we'll just mute everybody as well before the next speaker comes on. So thanks, Andrew, if we just mute everybody. Welcome officially. I'm sorry that we can't be here together in person, but it's the Zoom world these days, and um, at least we can get together this way through technology to be able to share what we need to share today. My name's Jason Cronshaw. I'm the president of Blue Mountains Tourism, and this is Anthea Hammond, the vice president. And what I would like to do today is just go through a little bit of the history of Blue Mountains Tourism, where we've come from, and how we fit in the wider industry. And then I'll introduce the speakers, so you've got some idea of what we're going to learn today. And then just a little bit of the, um, what will happen throughout the presentation. We are recording the presentation as well, so if people have missed it or you need to go and do something, we'll be able to send the recording out after today's session as well. So Blue Mountains Tourism has been established, the, the entity has been established for 39 years, and it started as the Blue Mountains Accommodation Association 39 years ago. And then it was in 2012, which it changed to being the Blue Mountains Accommodation and Tourism Association. And that was in a time where we had a regional tourism association, which you might remember, Bumlot, Blue Mountains, Lithgow and Oberon Tourism. And that's when the state was divided up into a number of regions. And the Blue Mountains was with Oberon and Lithgow. And at the time, the regional tourism organisation, BMLOT, because it was based here in Katoomba, also took on the role of being the local tourism organisation as well as being the regional tourism organisation. And that wasn't really best practice. So Lithgow and Oberon at the time had their own LTOs, the local tourism associations as well. So Bermata decided that through consultation with Destination New South Wales and the City Council to become the local tourism organisation. So that was back in 2012. And then the BMLOT, the demise of that, story for another day if you don't know that story, um, closed its doors, but there was a number of other regional tourism organisations around the state that also closed its doors at the same time. So then Destination New South Wales set up what they called the Destination Networks. And so we're part of Destination Sydney Surrounds North, um, and Michael and Glenn are here today. Hi, Michael and Glenn. So we're part of that regional network while Blue Mountains Tourism, we've changed our name now to Blue Mountains Tourism to be a little bit more consumer-friendly brand name rather than the longer acronym of Bamata, but that still, the entity is still the same entity. It's a membership-based organisation, so we've had members for the 39 years, and that really has been what's enabled Blue Mountains Tourism to operate. We don't get any direct government funding to operate our day-to-day -day operations. We get some money from Blue Mountain City Council for specific projects that we work on together. We've done projects together such as Go Blue a little while ago and we've also then get other grants like the, Blue, the federal money for the bushfire grant money which is one of the reasons we're getting together today so you can hear about how that's working and we'll hear about that later today. But so it's really that whole history is where we are today sitting that sitting here as the local tourism organisation that has taken on the role of what the local tourism organisation does as well as some of the old history of what the regional tourism association used to do. Working closely with Tourism Australia, hi Dom, um, and working closely with Destination New South Wales, working closely with Destination Surrounds North and also of course Blue Mountain City Council. So while we're a membership based organisation we represent the whole region and what we've done in the last 12 months as well with close consultation with Blue Mountain City Council is really to broaden the network of Blue Mountains Tourism way beyond members, to include everybody as part of our newsletters, as part of our Facebook page and as part of our communication. So that's why today we've got a lot of people who have perhaps are new to Blue Mountains Tourism um, and we welcome that and we want to continue to grow that to become a wider voice for the whole industry in the Blue Mountains, not just the membership that traditionally we've, we've been here today. So to introduce and have a little bit of a, a rundown on, on what we're doing today, we've got um, Destination New South Wales, um, Tanil, who's the Regional Tourism Deve Development Manager. 
Tanil's going to give us an update for what's happening at Destination New South Wales and what's going to be coming into the future. Just before Tanil, we've also got Minister Stuart Ayres have done a recording for us, which we'll watch in a moment. We've got Dom from Tourism Australia, who's been a great supporter on the whole Tourism Australia front for the Blue Mountains. We've got also Corporate to Community, Renee and Rebecca, who are going to be talking about the Blue Mountains Resilience Program that they've been working on with Business Blue Mountains. And Business Blue Mountains is also a new name perhaps for some of you. Business Blue Mountains is an entity that has been formed and is in the process of growing and developing. And that really comes out of the old BizNet, which some of you may remember, and the old regional chambers. And that is really collecting together the Blue Mountains chambers that are in existence now to bring them in and under the one umbrella. So we'll hear from Renee and Rebecca what's happening on that front. And we've also got Sean from National Parks and Wildlife Service who's going to give us a presentation on the Grand Clifftop Walk project, where that's up to and the plans for that for the future, which is going to be, when that's completed, a great asset for the Blue Mountains to have. And then, of course, we've got Anthea and Andy from Blue Mountain City Council who are going to talk about the $2.6 million bushfire grant that we've received. Well, we haven't received it yet. The money's not in the bank, but we've been promised the money. So that's a very exciting um, opportunity for the whole region coming. And then we've also got a few Slido surveys throughout the morning that we'll be putting up into the chat room. After each speaker, we'll have a chance for questions and answers as well. And um, the process of that is really, you know, most people have been in Zoom, just put your hand up or hit the button that you want to ask a question. And either the speaker who's just spoken will be able to answer that, or Anthony and I will be here if it needs to be directed to us. And then right at the end of the session, before we close, we'll also have a question and answer time, which some of the speakers are here for the whole morning, others um, are just coming in to speak. So at the end of the day, we'll be here, or the end of the morning, we'll be here to then go through anything else you need to know. We've also got the questions that have been sent in, so we'll get through them either as the speakers are speaking or definitely by the end of the day as well. So thanks very much again for coming. For those people who've just joined us, um, we look forward to sharing the information throughout the morning. But first of all, we're going to hear from our Tourism Minister, Stuart Ayres. Hopefully. Hello, Stuart Ayres here for New South Wales Tourism Minister. First of all, I wanted to thank you all for gathering today to today's digital... ...in our region. ...personal resilience to the tourism sector in the state of New South Wales, but particularly your beautiful location in the Blue Mountains. We know that it's been a most traumatic time across the tourism... Hello, Stuart Ayres here, the New South Wales Tourism Minister. First of all, I wanted to thank you all for gathering today for today's digital forum on tourism in the Blue Mountains. It's a clear demonstration of your commitment and your own personal resilience to the tourism sector in the state of New South Wales, but particularly your beautiful location, the Blue Mountains. We know that it's been a most traumatic time across the tourism sector, and many of you on the call today would have felt the worst effects of the government restrictions and the impacts of COVID-19. I can tell you that there are a few weeks to go before we can remove those restrictions as our vaccination rates continue to increase. But there is no doubt in my mind that there are brighter days ahead. I am forecasting that there'll be a strong recovery of the New South Wales tourism sector as restrictions come down and citizens are able to move around their states. I'm confident that we'll see a surge out into regional locations as people escape the Sydney lockdown. I'm also confident of a strong recovery right across the tourism sector. Now, what it means is that you've got to use this time now to prepare. So today's digital forum is an important step in that direction. It's been a very difficult period of time, there's no doubt about that, but there should be a sense of optimism. There's a strong sense brewing through the community of a need to renew, a new need to renew each other and a need to renew ourselves as we come out of this lockdown. I can't think of a better location for that spirit to be captured than in the Blue Mountains. So today's forum is an important step for each and every business to start engaging with each other, to communicate with each other and start to prepare for that recovery. Customers are just around the corner. So the things that you need to do to get your businesses ready to capture that, now's the time to be working on those. Inside the New South Wales government, we're doing exactly the same thing. 
We're preparing for recovery. We're preparing to prime pump the market and drive demand right across the state. The Blue Mountains will benefit substantially from that. We've been through a most traumatic and difficult time, but there are brighter days ahead. Thank you for coming together today. Thank you for being resilient. Thank you for the strength of character that you've demonstrated over these last 18 months. We will get out of this and the Blue Mountains will return to being a jewel in the crown of the New South Wales tourism sector. Have a great day. Thanks, Stuart. Next, we've got Tennille Jenkins from Destination New South Wales. And just while Tennille's getting ready to speak, we've also got our first Slido survey that we will have a few questions today. So just in the chat box there, there's a Slido survey that you can click on. And that's just going to be a few questions that will get answered throughout the morning as well from everybody when you get this chance, please. So over to Tennille. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Anthea. And um, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As Jason said, my name is Tennille Jenkins and I'm the Regional Tourism Development Manager for Sydney Surrounds North at Destination New South Wales. I have a lot to cover in my time frame today, so I'm going to kick off straight away and get started. Destination New South Wales is the lead agency champion and voice for the visitor economy within the New South Wales government. Our purpose is to deliver economic and social benefits for the people of New South Wales by growing the visitor economy. The New South Wales government um, has said that vaccinations will be the key to moving through this pandemic and we really know how important that is for all of us um, who are engaged in the visitor economy. Being able to get back to business, you know, resume travel, see our families and have gatherings and events as soon as it is safe to do so is the light at the end of the tunnel for us all. And with yesterday's announcement that we have hit six million jabs, um, it's a really encouraging step forward for us. We're planning a suite of initiatives to ensure that we're really ready when restrictions begin to ease. And these are recovery campaign planning, a New South Wales first industry development work, uh, which uh, Minister Ayres announced uh, on Friday, the free new skills and development and training programs. Information gathering and advocacy. We're listening to businesses and industry partners such as yourselves. It's a significant part of our role and we really continue to collate that information and case studies and share your feedback with the New South Wales government around the impact of COVID-19. And we know that many of you are concerned about eligibility criteria for support programs and the confidence to start activity and events when it's safe to do so. A really big thank you for those who have formed part of these conversations for us already. Providing updates on support for business and individuals, the New South Wales government has announced a range of support programs to help ease financial pressure um, during this time. For guidance and updates, uh, we encourage you really to stay up to date with our industry, news industry newsletter, which is Insights. And as soon as the New South Wales government pro provides any detail about the way forward or COVID safe practices and requirements for businesses and individuals, we will share that through that platform. We also know that Service New South Wales are working really hard to deliver as much support and process as many grants as possible. The industry is looking forward to knowing how we're going to support you and businesses and the state out of the pandemic. I can tell you that the team is currently working, gathering on intel, on the consumer sentiment and what visitors are actually looking for when we come out of lockdown. And we're preparing for a really phased return to activity. We expect that in the first phase of the transition, we will launch domestic promotional campaigns and we'll leverage other New South Wales government initiatives such as voucher programs and ticketed in venue and regional events with the return to COVID safe programming. The next step will be to convince our uh, industry development activities and launch domestic airline and trade partnership campaigns and see even more flagship events come back to life. I wanted to briefly mention some of the New South Wales government initiatives. The Dine and Discover voucher scheme has been extended until the 30th of June 2022, uh, which means residents can now use their remaining vouchers for an additional 11 months. The New South Wales Government will also provide increased security for tenants and financial support for landlords by extending the residency, 
residential tenancy support package. And for more information or to apply for this, you can go to the New South Wales Fair Trading. Service New South Wales and Treasury uh, recently hosted a webinar which outlined various support measures available to businesses who were impacted or who are impacted by COVID-19. Uh, and you can watch this back on demand um, via the Service New South Wales website. Lastly, I just wanted to mention, I know that many accommodation providers have been awaiting the support payment package and these will be available in late September. Accommodation providers are though encouraged to check their eligibility and apply for other business support programs first, including the COVID-19 business support grant, Job Saver, the micro business grants, and payroll tax deductions first. If you're a small business owner, the New South Wales government has some fantastic personalised support available to you. The business concierge can guide you through the changes to regulations and any assistance to available at the moment to small businesses. They can help identify and understand the convoluted sometimes Service New South Wales website and any of the support available to you. There's also Business Connect, which is a dedicated and personalised program that provides advice to help you start, run and adapt your small business. Uh, it includes free workshops and webinars to help you manage your cash flow, change any business models, sell goods and services online and market your business in this current environment. Destination New South Wales is dedicated to growing the visitor economy and supporting tourism businesses and we do this through our New South Wales FIRST program. Our first, this program was uh, first established to help tourism businesses around the state to develop, promote and sell great tourism experiences. You can visit our website on demand to watch webinars and upcoming events, video tutorials, business guides and tips. There's some really great resources there to help with whatever you need. And if you're not sure where to start, you can reach out to myself or Michael Foster on the call today from the Destination Network. It's really important to note though that the New South Wales FIRST program, we mentor businesses at whatever stage they're at, whether they're a long-term business or someone who's just starting out new in the tourism industry. And our team bring their expertise and insights into every conversation. And we've worked with many tourism businesses over the years across New South Wales. And for many, the New South Wales FIRST program has made a huge difference. I'm really excited today to be able to announce that we have two new initiatives that the government has just announced for the New South Wales FIRST program. We've partnered with Restaurant and Catering Australia and social media giant Facebook to deliver a suite of new skills uh, development and training programs. And these can all be accessed via our website, which is www.destinationnewsouthwales.com.au forward slash New South Wales First. The first initiative is the Customer Service and Online Short Courses, which is a group of three free online short courses known as micro credentials. And they're being delivered by Restaurant and Catering Australia, tailored for New South Wales tourism and hospitality audience. And it's in partnership with us. The courses are available on demand and can be completed by the participants at their own pace. The second initiative we have is the Facebook and Instagram for Tourism webinars, which is delivered by Facebook. A series of five webinars that will feature guest presenters from Facebook and our social team, providing tailored content for New South Wales tourism businesses to help develop and optimise their presence on social media. We really want you to help us keep Blue Mountains in the news at the moment. We want to help uncover those stories and story ideas and, as I said, keep Blue Mountains in the news. We want to make sure that they keep writing inspiring travel content all about the Blue Mountains. Please, if you have an opportunity, share with us any case studies or positive news stories. Maybe there is a business that has been fortunate to be able to change and adapt and work with the community or change their business model during the current lockdown. Maybe there is a business out there who has some fantastic initiative for your call to arms about getting the industry to proactively support vaccinations. We know that Crystal Brook Hotels has just announced free upgrades to vaccinated travellers. If you have a compelling story and a call to arms, we really want to hear about it. 
please continue to share your media releases with us, your travel packages, any updates to your product with our PR team and via the email address on the screen. There's three ways at the moment that you can really help to promote your product. A great opportunity for you to engage with potential visitors that are dreaming about and planning their next getaway by offering tips and local recommendations by getting social. Engage with our platforms, include our hashtags on your post and tag us to be part of the conversation. You can tag us on Facebook, Instagram, and we've just launched a TikTok account. Get connected, it's our free membership website program. List your business on visitnewsouthwales.com by Get Connected. And please note that Visit New South Wales is the call to action for all of our campaign activity, which is gonna be really important for that recovery piece going forward. If you have time, please review and update your listing, upload new images and ensure that your description is accurate, engaging. And you can also link your online booking software if relevant, so users can book directly through visitnewsouthwales.com from your listing. ATDW have also just announced two new features, which is Google My Business, which enables users to seamlessly link your existing Google My Business account to your ATDW listing, and also a fantastic new dashboard which displays the performance of your ATDW profile. And lastly, make your business shine. Do you need any content, videos, imagery to help make your business look better across platforms? You can access imagery, video, and also copy collections on our content library. And you can use them across your platforms and your marketing for free to promote the destination and experiences within New South Wales. We've also launched on there some new images um, as part of the recent media partnership with Blue Mountain City Council. So if you haven't had an opportunity, please go on there and have a look. I know most of you probably have um, smartphones. So if you do have your smartphones available, please um, scan the QR code on your screen and sign up to our Insights newsletter to receive updates about upcoming opportunities, events, and any information from the New South Wales government. We really look forward to working with you and Blue Mountains and Blue Mountains City Council to see this region build and build on its fantastic tourism offering and grow the visitor economy. And we know there's some really exciting things to come for the region and we're gonna hear about it more later today. But after today's session, if there's three key takeouts for you, that will be to join our free new skills development and training programs or encourage your staff to. Set up and update your ATDW listing and be front of mind with media partners. So share your news with us. My contact details are on the screen for anyone who would like more information or has any questions. And I'd really love to hear from you. And there's also Michael's detail from the Destination Network. Uh, and I know that Michael has um, been fabulous in, in providing all the links to us today in the chat box. So lastly, I just wanted to take an opportunity to say thank you. Thanks, uh, was there... Has anybody got any questions for Tanil? Uh, and if, if, this stage. Sorry, if there's sorry nothing at the moment, you can you okay. uh, hopefully you've got my email address, and um, by all means, please feel free to reach out at any time. Thanks, Tanil. Daniel, yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Tanil. Um, thank you very much. At the, at the, um, towards the start of, of what you were saying, you mentioned about COVID safe programming. Um, what do you mean by that? Um, for COVID safe programming, um, so we're just at the moment looking um, at what that what our messaging will be for the COVID safe um, tourism businesses. So we're working with the New South Wales government to establish what that means. So I don't, have, I don't have a lot of detail on that at the moment, but when we have more detail, we'll be able to share that with you. Okay, thank you. Cool, thanks very much, Tanil. So now we're thank moving you. on to Dom from Tourism Australia. Dom's been a great supporter for the Blue Mountains and for the whole of Australia promoting internationally and recently domestically, but over to you, Dom. Thank you so much, Luke. Let me work the technology, share my screen, and hopefully, can everyone see that in full screen? Not yet. 
Right. Moment of truth. Yes. Yes, I've got it. Tell them. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Um, really great to be here today to give you a bit of an update on what we're up to at Tourism Australia and a bit of our thinking in terms of the future as well. And before we do kick off, um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which we all are today. I'm coming to you live from Gadigal and Wongal country here. And I would very much like to extend my respect to elders past, present and emerging and also to any Torres Strait Islander or Aboriginal people on this call today as well. Um, for those of you not familiar with Tourism Australia, so our role is very much at that federal level. Um, I always like to sort of explain it as we are that umbrella um, in terms of the industry. We're all about that national message. Historically, we are all about international so as you can imagine, it's been an interesting um, sort of 18 months for us, um, but we did actually step back into domestic in regard to the bushfire response at the start of last year. So yeah, that I think was one of my last times we were speaking at a Bamata conference as it was at the time, all about bushfires. And I guess, you know, little, little did we know what was on the horizon um, after that. In terms of what we're up to as TA, um, for us, it is really all about focusing initially sort of on that short-term survival of the industry, but also thinking ahead in terms of that long-term prosperity as well. The interesting thing has really been that in the sort of immediate um, space, obviously, you know, immediate survival, um, when things aren't locked down, things were actually starting to get back sort of into pretty positive territory. So it does show that the domestic market um, in particular does actually have that resilience. So you can see there in April, um, you know, we were really trending upwards and interestingly enough, expenditure was actually um, up on sort of what it was previously. The challenge, however, um, is that, you know, the volatility in terms of border situations um, and generally that feeling of safety around the country does really actually impact that demand as we would all be well aware of. Um, even when people can travel, the issue is it's the confidence. And, you know, the more lockdowns and things happen, the more that confidence is actually affected. In regard to our approach um, to how things are, thinking about that sort of that immediate survival and really getting the industry through it, we do completely understand it is very much that domestic led recovery. So at Tourism Australia, our role is really to encourage Australians to travel like our overseas visitors would. So we're very much promoting the category of travel. You know, don't do the house renovations, go on a holiday. Um, don't buy the new car, go on a holiday. It's really as easy as that. Interestingly enough, if you look at outbound travellers, so Australians going overseas on holiday, we spend around $6,500 um, on a trip. Whereas when international visitors come into Australia, they're spending just over $5,000. So we actually spend more money overseas than visitors do coming here. And the reason I mention that is it really shows that if we can convince Australians to spend that money that they probably have squirreled away somewhere um, domestically, then as an industry, um, it is actually possible for us to get through things until those international borders do open. So all of our activity has been under that Holiday Here This Year banner, which was a message that we launched first in response to the bushfires. We found that it resonated really well with consumers in terms of, you know, just, I guess, a rally cry in terms of supporting the industry, but also really highlighting those beautiful destinations, those beautiful experiences that actually exist all around the country. Over the last 12 months, we've had a number of different activations, sort of, I guess, or, or campaigns rather in the times when people could travel. Um, one of these is Epic Holidays, which was all about getting people, you know, to travel far and wide, especially those internationally reliant destinations and really also trying to drive that interstate travel. And then also focusing on some of those, um, what we almost call market failures, those regions that aren't getting the visitation. So cities we found really did have um, a very negative um, impression of them by consumers. So it was all about sort of highlighting what there is to do in cities and that side of things. Obviously with what's happening at the moment, um, the whole country is, is sort of in a, in a bit of a um, sad state, but um, we will again get back to sort of um, focusing on 
all those beautiful things that they are out and about around the country. So pictured here is really a work in progress plan for what our next sort of nine-ish um, months look like. In the short term, um, we're very much focused on getting those jabs into arms um, as part of the It's Our Best Shot to Travel campaign. We've got some exciting content partnership work um, coming a little bit later in the year. And then our first real, I guess, consumer sort of conversion, um, getting people into destination type campaign will be focused in terms of that Christmas and that summer holiday booking period. So it will be all around that idea of gifting travel. Um, you know, don't give socks, give snorkeling, that type of, uh, that type of concept. Then um, during the actual sort of summer break, um, it will be all around getting people who are potentially already on holiday to spend money doing those experiences, to do the tours, to visit the attractions and not just go to a destination and, and sort of flop and drop, do the free things, but to actually spend some money in that wider visitor economy. Then we'll be going back into sort of those epic holidays, so those, um, those bigger, longer trips um, as well, and then a bit of focus on the cities um, too. And within all of this, as you can imagine, a lot of um, flex, because we do need to really move with what is actually happening around the place. Our vaccination initiative um, is hopefully one that you have seen over the last couple of weeks, um, largely sort of through the digital channels. And this has really been um, about getting that national message out there that by getting vaccinated um, against COVID-19, this is really the way that people can move around the country again, um, see the friends and family, go on those holidays, and that this is really what we need um, right now. There's been really great pickup um, from operators, and a lot of them have actually mentioned that it's been useful to really motivate their own staff to get vaccinated. And you know, if you think about all the people working in tourism in the Blue Mountains, for example, just getting jabs into all of those arms is already a really great step forward, and it really just helps to build that groundswell. So there's assets um, that you're actually able to access as operators as well, um, and those can all be found on those corporates on the corporate site. And I'll put some links um, in the chat after my presentation as well. And then after this, as mentioned, the first sort of um, real campaign that you'll see that above the line work will be all around that holiday gifting. And here's um, some of the creative that we actually had from last year. And so it'll be on a very similar concept to this. In regard to the international markets, um, which I know a lot of operators um, and people on the call have put a lot of focus in in the past, um, this does really still remain a key focus for us. And for us, it's really all about making sure that we don't waste all that hard work that has been put in over decades by Australia and by Australian operators in those markets. So we're all about maintaining that long-term demand. And then as soon as things do open, um, most likely it looks like sort of in sort of bubble stages, we can really drive that conversion quickly. And here it is, I guess, explained in a graph form that it is really all about that initial sustaining of that demand um, through a lot of sort of that dreaming content and um, keeping the communication up with our trade partners and then really ready to ramp things up when things do open up um, from overseas. And I guess on this, I should mention, because the challenge of us is going to be the moment that our borders open in sort of both directions, a lot of Australians are going to want to head overseas on holiday. So we really need to make sure that we can then fill that gap with those overseas visitors actually coming into the country as well. A positive um, thing here that's come out in our research is that a lot of our historic barriers, um, namely the, the main three of, of time, distance and cost um, for Australia as a destination, have actually really come through as positives, um, considering everything that's happening around the world. So the fact that we're, you know, take a long time to get around the country because everything's so spaced out means that it is a sparsely populated um, destination. Distance, we're on um, the arse end of the world, um, pardon my French, means that we're isolated. Um, you know, we've managed things quite well down here. And the fact that we are a little bit more of an expensive destination actually comes through in terms of the safety and the quality in terms of that um, holiday destination. And on that um, sort of cost side of things, um, I would like to share this, this little stat. So this, um, this is some research from um, some of our consumer demand project. Um, and it actually shows that um, good food and wine has now overtaken the importance of value for money in terms of a holiday. So hopefully we'll have sort of that move towards a more hedonistic holiday moving forward. So spending um, lots of money around um, in our visitor economy. 
And the great thing is that the demand is returning around the world. So this graph here actually shows forward bookings. Um, so the top blue line is overseas, our, our top 15 markets, um, traveling to our competitor destinations. Um, and so it shows those booking levels compared to 2019 are actually trending upwards. Um, so once things open, um, we are confident that Australia can play as part of that. And, and down the bottom actually shows Australia. So you can see Australia still um, chugging along sort of at negatives as can be completely understood right now. Um, just quickly in terms of what we're doing um, overseas. So we're gonna be continuing a lot of the great content partnership work that we do um, in terms of working with those international partners. Um, so pictured at the top there, that Escape magazine is um, a partnership with Waitrose in the UK. Um, a lot of great work in our social media space as well, with a lot of content um, amplification there. Um, a lot of always on press work as well, focused um, a lot on sustainability and indigenous um, as well. And then we will continue to do localized activations in terms of events as relevant and a whole lot of other trade work um, as well through our online events with those international partners. And that distribution space, does remain so, so important. Um, pictured here, just some of the trainings that our Aussie specialist um, trainers have done. We've got a team of 21 in-market trainers who are still spending days doing webinars and updates to those frontline travel agents to make sure that that expertise is still there to send visitors to Australia when it is safe to do so. And just lastly, um, do be sure to check out that um, Tourism Australia corporate website um, in terms of all the resources that I have mentioned on here, um, as well as things um, such as broader international research, domestic research, and on there you can also find our um, Working with Tourism Australia guide that has everything to do with our hashtags um, through to how to get in touch with our media team and all of that. Um, Likewise, don't forget to subscribe to our Essentials newsletter. Um, if you haven't already, that comes out once a week and has all the main TA updates. And um, after TJ's presentation, I do have to say, make sure you check out those New South Wales um, first programs. Those new programs are fantastic. Um, I see a lot that the other STOs do, and I have to say, like, this is definitely some best-in-class stuff. Um, I think those um, social media ones in particular, and then the, you know, the restaurant and catering piece um, is a fantastic initiative. And you know, I should also mention, um, it has been tough out there. Um, you can only put so much lipstick on a pig, um, to put things plainly. So if you are um, you know, having any challenges in terms of mental health, there are a lot of great resources out there as well. I'll put a couple um, in the chat box. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, the great thing is, you know, we are such a collaborative industry. You can see by the number of people on this call. Um, so don't be afraid to ask for help if you do need it. And with that, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to take any questions and also my details are there if you have any questions offline as well. Thank you. Thanks, Dom. Any questions for Dom? Daniel? Oh, that last one. Hi, thank you again. Um, there was a, a slide there which said best shot for traveling, um, yep. getting shots into arms. That's unclear to me, Dominic. Uh, what do you mean by that? So what it basically means is um, the recent messaging has really been around the moment that the 70 to 80 percent vaccination rate is reached, that's when a lot of the restrictions will ease. So if you think of it as sort of once we reach that, that's what the governments, state and federal, have said that's when sort of the visitor economy can start to resume. So it's really about driving people to get to that 70 and 80 percent level. So we've been held to ransom? Um, that is unfortunately not, um, I guess, what I, I, I think it means. I think what it basically means is that that's what the government has said. So it's, you know, we're really trying to provide any resources that we can for operators to get the message out. And as I touched on, a lot of um, operators have really been thankful that this has provided a message. Um, and we are seeing a lot more uh, operators are actually making that commercial decision themselves now. I saw AAT Kings um, is going to come out soon with um, a message that all guests as well as staff on any AAT Kings long distance touring will actually need to be vaccinated. But that's that's all a commercial decision and I fully respect that as well. And Don, there's a question uh, in the chat. How do operators get involved in the gifting initiative? 
So what it will really be is we're going to focus, I guess, on a lot of different thematics um, through from, you know, walking, nature, icons, those sorts of things. So we're working very closely with the states and territories in terms of PR angles around that. And what I would say is a lot of what we do is we're often providing the platform um, in terms of sharing those stories. So similar to what Tanil from DNSW mentioned, um, send through any media releases on exciting new products, on um, any developments that you have. And then when our team puts together their pitch packs that they send out to media, then we can talk about those. So in the lead up to that campaign, for example, the team will put together any of the great sort of product ideas that they've seen from around the country that might work as gifts. And then that is shared with our media partners, whether it's print, whether it's um, TV, digital, um, all that sort of thing. So I'll put um, that email address in the chat box for you. And then any information that you have on things that you might think work as, you know, great gift ideas, um, you can send those through to there. Cool. Thanks again, Dominic. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hand the screen over to Renee and Rebecca from Corporate to Community. Corporate to Community have been working with Business Blue Mountains and they'll present what they're planning to do for all of us here in the Blue Mountains. Thanks, Jason. Um, can everyone, can you see that, my screen? Yep. Yes. Yep, perfect. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, really great to be part of today and congratulations and thank you for bringing the community together because we know the best thing about um, building a resilient community is people and people connections. So for those of you who I haven't connected with, I'm Renee Hansen, I'm the founder of Corporate to Community, and I'm just gonna take you through um, a couple of exciting grant opportunity projects that we have one in collaboration with Business BM, uh, the organization that Jason mentioned before, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so Corporate to Community, we're a certified social enterprise and we're committed to building disaster resilience. Um, we're most known for doing disasters differently. I think the world of disasters have shown us that we need to start doing disaster preparedness and resilience and recovery differently too. Um, we take an all hazards approach. So we know that you can take small steps to actually get your businesses and the business community prepared for 80% of disasters. So we don't just do a siloed approach for a bushfire or a flood. We really take that all hazards approach in all the initiatives that we do. And we also focus on before, during and after. We actually look at recovery also being before the next disaster. So recovery is very much um, needs to integrate resilience. And what we work to um, deliver on is about preparing for the during so that when the chaos hits, um, the businesses and business communities are really ready for the during. So I'm the founder, Rebecca Lang, who some of you will know is um, the Blue Mountains based person that we have engaged. So she's the face um, that you'll be seeing um, very much around town and we're really privileged and um, excited to have her on board. So she's with us for two years to deliver um, the projects that I'm just gonna share with you. So at Corporate to Community, we have a three um, pronged focus to build resilient businesses, to help communities thrive and to lead collaborations. That is the absolute um, foundation of what everything we do delivers to. We, um, we do it differently in the sense that we see businesses as communities because if we don't have resilient and sustainable and thriving businesses of all shapes and sizes, then our communities can't thrive. And to the same extent too, if we don't have thriving and resilient and sustainable communities, then our businesses won't succeed. So we very much look at our resilience in this two prong approach because organizational resilience and community resilience delivers to thriving communities, which has an outcome of business success. We're really privileged and really excited to have connected with um, Lawrence, Mike and Mark from Business BM. Jason alluded to before, they're a new entity and structure about really um, challenging and changing the landscape of business networks um, from the Blue Mountains. Uh, we approached them uh, with a couple of grant ideas that we had and we ended up flipping the whole grant submission because of what they were trying to do. And again, we feel really um, um, privileged to be working with them. And there's a lot of um, innovative um, outcomes to come, which will be in the next um, coming weeks. So the first grant um, that we have been successful in is the uh, BCRRF Stream 2, and it's focused on increasing resilience, capabilities, connections, and wellbeing in the Blue Mountains business community. So, oops, sorry, the project outputs for this one 
We have obviously engaged Rebecca as the local person. We are working with Business BM to create their strategic plan. We have developed a roadmap to um, uh, build capabilities, build knowledge and build connections. We are starting our stakeholder engagement um, activations. We will be surveying, focusing on resilience um, and well-being, and then reporting on those findings. Uh, there's a new website that is being developed at the moment, which is um, to become the epicenter of connecting. Uh, we are focusing on knowledge building because the more you know, the more resilient and prepared you can be as business owners and operators. And if nothing else, um, the 80-20 rule is a good one if I can teach you that today because um, for 20% of the effort, you can actually get your business prepared for 80% of the potential impacts. Uh, white papers, we're working with um, Professor Daniel Aldrich, who's a global expert on social capital, about doing some uh, leading research in terms of business networks. So again, helping position the Blue Mountains business community as um, leaders in networking. We have two do tanks. We don't know what they will be focused on at the moment, totally open to what the business community um, is wanting help to do. They're not think tanks, they're do tanks. So um, throughout the next few weeks and months, if you've got ideas or if there are problems um, that we identify, obviously with a collaboration with BMT, then really happy to have do tanks focusing on the um, tourism industry um, as one or two of them. We're working on events. Rebecca's gonna be reaching out to some businesses um, to do coffee catch ups. Uh, a bit like Tanil um, and um, the other presenter, sorry, Dominic, we really want to share the stories and we want to share the stories with um, each other, um, in, so across the Blue Mountains as much as I'm sharing it externally. Um, we will be integrating global blueprints, so national uh, send and uh, sorry, global Sendai frameworks for disaster risk reduction and sustainable development goals. We're really committed to implementing them in all the um, activities and initiatives. And we'll be looking to measure. So we really want to understand um, the levels of resilience and the capability levels in the Blue Mountains business community and, share, um, and challenge ourselves and obviously report on the successes um, in terms of capabilities and connections that we build. The Blue Mountains, um, uh, sorry, Business BM is obviously a big part of how we'll be delivering um, these outcomes. The project is to set up Business BM as the business community network. So the website, everything is to support them. It's not about C2C, it's about Business BM. It's about creating an inclusive environment for businesses. So we want to, um, the projects are about all businesses being able to participate, regardless of your size, industry, location, obviously a really important role for um, tourism businesses. It's place-based focused. We look at place-based at a um, next door neighbours businesses, uh, the street of shops or businesses, as well as towns and regions. So we're very much um, about um, supporting the various layers and levels of place-based. Our business BM has a really big um, opportunity and exciting challenge to set up some governance structures that enable businesses and the business community, including um, BMT and other uh, organisations, to come together and really simplify and streamline. And that's what we hope to do, um, working alongside other groups and associations and really be that strong voice. So I think um, Jason and Anthea and the BMT have obviously, um, you know, play a really big leadership role in the Blue Mountains, um, a community that I've had a professional connection with for a number of years, and we want to participate and contribute to that as well. Lawrence Atkinson from Business BM was invited to present at the Prime Minister's um, uh, post bushfires Small Business Summit, um, and he's a really wonderful advocate and has a beautiful voice um, and key messaging. So we really want to support, um, again, the region of businesses having one voice out there. In terms of where we are for this grant, um, our website has launched. We have phase two coming, which has a lot more interaction and will include things like a business directory. Um, we'll be implementing um, uh, uh, links for helpful um, uh, solutions and tools to build resilience. We'll also be doing things like What If Wednesdays, once a month bringing specialists in to have conversations with, very conversational, very much connecting, and everything will have an element of small steps to help you build uh, resilience and preparedness and, you know, obviously during the recovery in your business. Um, we've got events, white papers and um, the do tanks coming and the website is uh, businessbm.com.au. We really welcome you to sign up 
and also we've got the traditional um, Facebook um, social media channels as well. The second grant that we have is the Blur Grant, so that's under the same funding um, stream as what the um, BMT Big Grant Exciting Project is. This is to pilot Australia's first regional business community resilience hub in the Blue Mountains. It's kind of same, same, but different. Um, so I'll just really quickly take you through that. I've already mentioned before the focus for business BM. So this grant is really an extension of that as well. So a local C2C person, also a local person to represent and include Indigenous businesses. It'll be about capturing the knowledge of expertise in resilience from businesses in the Blue Mountains. So we really want to see, hear, understand and empower and embrace what you're already doing. So there are wonderful stories of, you know, cleaners that can't clean and are creating, you know, amazing candle businesses that are going off the charts. So, you know, there's, um, I know there's um, a farm to plate, sort of there's great examples of businesses already really active in the resilient space in the Blue Mountains. We want to find them, we want to nurture them, and we want to then create um, programs um, that we share locally with businesses and also um, share with other communities um, outside around Australia and internationally to really set up the Blue Mountains business community as a resilience hub. And that also, that comes under a new structure that we have being the Resilient Australia Alliance, which is a top-down um, national approach to building resilience capabilities in every business across Australia. And we're starting this initiative in the Blue Mountains. So what it offers to the Blue Mountains business community is to be the first um, Resilient Australia Alliance hub. We can offer new economies because we're bringing in a new resilient, business resilience led um, revenue stream. Um, it'll be a global spotlight. We don't know this happening anywhere in the world. So we're wanting to, when um, the, uh, the airports open again, bring people in to come to the Blue Mountains to learn about business resilience. Um, it can bring in new visitors, obviously, from a uh, business uh, stream. And then we're going to upskill local experts. So the programs that we create will be co-designed with businesses and presented by businesses. So there are opportunities for you to become experts in tourism-related business resilience programs. You could um, end up being facilitators um, and hosting these forums that we'll be um, creating. So behind the Resilient Australia Alliance, we have a amazing um, volunteer leadership team. Um, uh, Kate Carnell, uh, you'll all know, is the former um, small business and family enterprise ombudsman. She is beyond supportive, can't wait to come into the Blue Mountains and do some really um, um, progressive initiatives. I spoke to Peter Strom yesterday, who's just retiring from COSBOA, from a small business perspective. Um, he's can't wait to come and do some, um, uh, uh, have some conversations and really advocate for the business community network as well. And the other person I just um, um, highlight here is David Parsons down the bottom. He is one of Australia's um, leading experts in emergency management. Um, he is an amazing person who is based in the Blue Mountains. He's writing a lot of the risk reduction handbooks for the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience. So from these experts and our way of thinking, we're focusing on organisational resilience, economic resilience, community resilience, and also emergency management planning. Because from David's view, as small business owners or any business owners in the Blue Mountains, you are also in many ways first responders. So we want to um, um, build the capabilities and help you to establish and identify the shared responsibility role that businesses can play and sometimes have to play um, in the communities too. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we are um, through these two projects and over the next two years, we are building a new business community network. We're not taking over from any existing structures. We're all about collaborating and um, enhancing and involving what's already happening and reimagining what it needs to be in the future because we've heard from the previous two speakers and I can actually uh, absolutely concur. We're in a new era of disasters and we need to be prepared. So we can prepare, again, 80-20 small steps to get prepared, but there are storms, fires, COVID, cyber attacks. There's a whole wad of um, disasters, unfortunately, just around the corner. It's about inclusiveness. The more businesses we can get prepared and get connected, the better for the Blue Mountains community. 
Um, what we're delivering is a supportive collaborative outcome. So we really, again, want to work with the great things that are already happening, highlight things that perhaps haven't been um, um, recognised and put you as a business community at the forefront. We want to build your knowledge and we want to focus on needs led. Needs led is the really important part and that's where you come in and organisations like BMT. If there are key needs that your tourism industry needs, let us know because we will bring you the resilience building knowledge and skills and um, information and tools to enable that to um, occur and help you stay in business. Because we know the best thing businesses can do before, during and after disasters is to stay in business safely. So we want to help you as much as we can to be able to keep trading and stay in business through these, through, through these two programs. So thanks so much. Um, I'm actually uh, based in Melbourne. Uh, can't wait to come up and visit again. And I'm actually working, and I have been for the past 18 months, from a uh, travel agent in, in Melbourne who obviously has um, really been impacted by the Victorian lockdown. So I'm renting an office in her space to help keep her in business. So really personally committed to keeping the um, travel industry in business as much as possible. And um, yeah, welcome any questions. Annette from number 14. Love yeah, hi Annette, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Um, I was just wondering, so when you were saying about resilience and the hub, which sounds fantastic, um, is Shane Fitzsimmons, where does like, his New South Wales role, is that something that is, um, I suppose David, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of experts there on disaster management and risk reduction and all the rest of it, is, yeah. is Shane Fitzsimmons is he aware of what's doing or is there any crossover with that or any extra help that can happen there? Yeah, and that thanks. That's a great question. So we've been having um, catch ups with Shane directly for many, many months. They are absolutely across um, what we're doing and really excited by it. Um, because it's a new initiative and obviously the, the business um, stakeholder group is, I guess it's a new group in the resilience space because it's very much been focused on communities or households. Um, so we are absolutely without doubt sharing every step of the way in terms of these pilots. Um, Kylie Bryden Smith, who's the new head of partnerships at Resilience New South Wales and Rosemary, who's head of capabilities, are really, really interested in what's happening here. So we will be keeping them informed. We'll be inviting um, the commissioner to come and be part of whatever is relevant. And then the intent is absolutely that the Resilience New South Wales learnings um, and policies and frameworks are integrated into what we do. And then our learnings um, and, and um, initiatives that we deliver is shared with them so that we collaborate in terms of a collective out outcome. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. I didn't know how much business stuff they actually were across, but yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think as I said, so the business, um, the business stakeholder group is obviously one of the many stakeholder groups, but I think as a, as a I mean, Resilience New South Wales is a really progressive um, cohort of people. Obviously, between all the you know the disaster impacts, there've been um, there's been a lot going on. In saying that, they've also been going through their uh, recruitment. Um, so the executive directors and directors, and they're just at the regional levels now. But um, Kylie Bryden Smith has a um, a business background. She used to work with Kate Carnell. She's 100% across supportive. They're really excited about um, the strategic focus of the Resilient Australia Alliance. Um, and yeah, we, were, we, were, we need to all come together and do it together. So. Yeah, in one thing, yeah, brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Renee. There is a few questions coming up in the chat as well. So maybe what I'll get ask you to do, we'll go on to national parks, but if you've got a chance, if you can yeah. just answer the ones relevant for yeah. your presentation, please. Perfect. So I'd like to introduce so now Sean from National Parks and Wildlife Service. Sean's going to tell us about the very exciting development for the Grand Clifftop Walk project. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, so just having a pair of people shoes here, unfortunately. Uh, the Grand Clifftop Walk, which uh, many of you may have heard about as currently the working name uh, for quite a significant investment uh, that we were currently uh, got in play, and I'm just Got, got an issue here with uh, sharing the screen, unfortunately, so if you just bear with me. Uh, 
Uh, so the Grand Cliff Belt Walk is the working name for a $14 million investment that the New South Wales government is putting into a walking connection that's extending along from Wentworth Hall through to Scenic World along, along the escarpment that looks out across onto Gamson Valley. Now, just before we go into that a, a bit, I'll just run through these general information and stats, which many of you will be very aware in, um, and across. So basically, in the last 10 years, uh, the National Park through Blue Mountains National Park has seen significant increase in visitation. And those, those figures that are on screen at the moment, uh, obviously are a bit of a replication of that. Uh, Blue Mountains National Park is, depending on uh, where you take the figures, but it's certainly uh, the most visited national park in New South Wales at present time. And a lot of that visitation is driven by short stay walking uh, opportunities as well as uh, the scenic vistas and the associated experiences that can be gained from that. What we have seen also is that with the release from uh, each of the lockdowns and certainly after the uh, April, May lockdowns last year or the stay at home situation, we saw some of the highest visitation uh, levels on our walking tracks that we had actually recorded during our period of um, visitation recording. So just on that, we're anticipating uh, with a release of uh, conditions for movement uh, later this year or when they take place, we're very likely to see a replication of that level of visitation jump. The New South Wales government has made significant investments uh, on a four year program and we're in uh, year three of that program now. So there's uh, $90 million in visitor infrastructure development, uh, which is primarily based on the development of specific nature way based walks. And about eight of those that have been identified across the state, uh, one of which is the Grand Cliff Bolt Walk. There's also a complementary Improving Access to National Parks program, uh, which is $150 million across the state, which is reflected in walking tracks as well, uh, and campgrounds, and a range of lookout and other developments uh, to improve access and accessibility across the national parks through the state. Look, many of you will also be aware of uh, the background for the increase in the market for walking, especially overnight walking. And a lot of that is related to uh, the trends that we've seen with very socially oriented uh, family groups, but especially groups of uh, friends, uh, groups of girlfriends, big component of the market, that guide, that added, that added value element of having a guide, which also brings in uh, levels of security uh, and strong feelings of comfort with regards to safety. Uh, been a very repeat business, a strong level uh, of addiction as part of the wording that uh, we're using, but it's certainly um, significant growth and a level of repeat business that we see uh, very consistently across the park and also uh, across the country as well. And the Great Walks of Australia is one of the main uh, recognisable uh, brands that in play at the moment in the marketplace. The level of uniqueness for each individual experience is essential, and that's one aspect that's uh, driven the consideration for the Grand Cliff Belt Walk as well. The Grand Cliff Belt Walk experience, as I mentioned, is a $14 million project. So out of that, uh, $10 million has been provided for the National Parks component, and $4 million to the Blue Mountain City Council for the council-managed components of the pathway. Uh, just very briefly, the walk starts at Wentworth Falls train station and connects through via the Charles Darwin walk down to Wentworth Falls and then follows existing uh, pathways which are in varying states of condition uh, through from Wentworth Falls, uh, around Fairmont, uh, across through into Gordon Falls, Falls of Salome, uh, Lura, and then the escarpment of the Prince Henry track, uh, South Lura, through to Katoomba, Echo Point, the Three Sisters, 
and terminating uh, through at Scenicwil. So we've got a 14 kilometre uh, walk that has amazing vistas, uh, very different elements of landscape. You know, we're talking rainforest, we're talking uh, dry forest, and obviously one of the main draw cards is just a very strong uh, occurrence of great lands, uh, basically viewing areas uh, and lookouts uh, throughout the track. And one of the aspects that we've been looking at in conjunction with council is which of these lookouts uh, will get a significant redevelopment uh, investment in, in them. And we're just finalising that at the present stage it's just for those who get that uh, level of input. Uh, the walk itself is an overnight walk. So the intention is that the communities that we have along uh, the walk, Wentworth Falls, uh, Lura, Katoomba, uh, the BMBs, the accommodation providers uh, in each of the towns, uh, obviously uh, the food and beverage providers as well, and the other range of uh, businesses that actually can leverage off uh, this opportunity uh, do so. It's, it's really focused on basically providing a physical infrastructure piece to further develop and uh, enhance uh, business opportunities uh, throughout each of the villages and utilising the walkway itself. And I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly. Uh, the amazing scenery and the unique uh, elements of the walk are going to be the strong drivers. One of the other important pieces that we're investing in, and this is a comment that we get a little bit, is where does, the, where does the money go? The importance of the walk that we're delivering is basically a consistent standard and experience, physical experience in the walking surface. Uh, so to that end, you will have seen quite a number uh, of white bags either lying adjacent um, in car or parking lay-by areas adjacent to tracks, uh, in some local reserves that have been closed while well, helicopter operations have been in place, lifting in the bags over the last couple of years. That'll continue for the next 18 months or so. And the reason for that is really to, to bring in materials to repair uh, significantly eroded and damaged walking surfaces, build new staircases, and really give that um, ease of walking experience uh, for a broad market. So everything from uh, families uh, with uh, youngsters uh, through to uh, walkers that are a little bit more focused on uh, just enjoying the walking experience uh, rather than having to significantly uh, train or exert for eight hours in a day and then eight hours the next day. It really is a mix and match walking experience uh, with the general hero experience being uh, the multi-day uh, easily managed, easily accessed, and uh, very well supported through uh, the townships and the community services, through the businesses, accommodation providers, and we talked about the food and beverage elements as well. So a very strong uh, base to develop all sorts of options and opportunities to take to market and product. Uh, in regards to the milestones that we're looking at, uh, we have another two years of the project uh, to see us through to completion. Uh, the physical construction works are anticipated to be completed by June 23. The other elements of experience development uh, include uh, the in, well, wayfinding and signage packaging to ensure that any of the walkers and our visitors uh, have that strong sense of security and comfort that they actually know where they're going, that they're uh, reassured that they're on the correct pathways and the tracks, for example, and there's a strong component of works taking place at the present time to uh, put that in place. And there's also a very significant in, well, interpretation uh, element that's been put together. Now that may be digital and some of it may be on site, what we talk about is interpretation, which is a very traditional means of a sign on site. But with the uh, strong elements of mobile connectivity around the pathway and the whole of the walk, uh, we are focusing a lot more on those digital elements as well. What we are doing as national parks is trying to also answer a lot of the questions that we get about 
constraints on business activity and the opportunities that can actually be taken up on park. And the Grand Cliff Top Walk is one of these opportunities where we are looking at being very open uh, to the product, to uh, recommendations, to uh, approaches that are made to us uh, from um, either existing businesses, uh, new businesses that may be um, interested in undertaking works on the and providing uh, experiences connected to or on the, the walkway as well. One of the uh, smaller pieces may be, for example, uh, just businesses that want to provide uh, food and beverage opportunities um, at points along the walk, uh, at known luncheon spots or uh, morning teas, afternoon teas or the like, uh, through to the traditional guiding opportunities. Uh, so that's really uh, open to uh, the industry itself and coming through and working with uh, the National Parks teams and the Glenelg City Council teams uh, on how we can best leverage off uh, this significant investment. Uh, yeah, that's probably a very quick snapshot of uh, where we're leading. There is also other investment taking place across a range of other walking tracks that connect through or uh, diverge off uh, the Grand Cliff Top Walk. And that will also uh, obviously build on the experiences that we're anticipating uh, will be very uh, positively received off this walk from uh, new visitors and uh, potentially returning visitors as well. And that's a very strong component of what we're working to as our secondary experiences uh, in this overall walking track investment, which is over the four year period, uh, we'll see uh, over $20 million invested in the walking track uh, around Wentworth Falls, Toomba, and Blackheath. So, yeah, certainly uh, throw me any questions if you want to join. Yeah, Sean, if I could ask. Um, very little talk about supporting infrastructure, yes. such as parking, toilets. Um, we know that Wentworth Falls End is clogged on a busy weekend. Uh, you can't move. Um, what considerations being given to the broader issues? Yeah, so there, we've been working with council on that. In the in the short term, uh, there's a new toilet uh, and redevelopment take, that'll take place around the conservation hut. So the toilets uh, and the parking arrangements around the conservation hut are currently being uh, considered and new toilets are uh, funded for the conservation hut as well. Uh, there has been discussion about some of the investment at a few of the other sites on some of the council reserves. Uh, at this stage, most of the investment on the Grand Clifftop Walk is primarily on the walk, with the exception of what has been done at Wentworth Falls and is intended to be undertaken at the conservation hut at this stage. So no, no consideration at this stage of traffic management and parking? Uh, in, the, in the short term, no. Uh, but we are working with Council for National Parks and Council are uh, looking at longer term parking strategies. Uh, and it's also, well, we refer to it as parking strategies, it's more uh, transport strategies, uh, whether or not the issues to do with uh, movement of visitors or and walkers between uh, different entry nodes might be facilitated by uh, shuttle services or uh, other uh, potential means as well. So. It is certainly a significant issue that is recognised by both council uh, and national parks certain, and at certain specific sites uh, that we know are under pressure. Right, thank you. Hi, Sean. Um, my name's Annette from number 14 Lovell Street in Katoomba. Um, my question, sorry if I missed a, a mention of it, was is there anything for either for this walk or for um, in upgrading the other walks around the place to have water refill stations for walkers? Uh, that has been brought up, uh, yes. So it's under cons uh, we're looking into it and where it's, where it's viable, where there's existing recirculation systems. Um, and at present, that's at most, that's at a number of nodes, a couple of the council reserves, uh, mm -hmm. some of the sites like the conservation hut mm -hmm. uh, and a few points like, like those sites. 
some of the uh, more secondary uh, entry points on to walk, which are at the end of some of the cul-de-sacs or uh, the side from right of ways coming off um, some of the residential roads. Uh, we haven't got those access uh, points to water identified for those sites at this stage. Mm -hmm. But there will be some of them. In but it is something that is being considered as things are being improved and redeveloped, that there is that, can we get it in if we can? It's, yes. it's part of it. Yeah, great. Yes. Thank you. Romola, you got your hand up? Yep. Yeah, I, ha I, have got, I have got my hand up. Um, and I just, just wanted to say uh, thanks, thanks to Sean for um, that overview and just to remind everybody that it is a joint um, initiative with Blue Mountain City Council. And I just wanted to flag um, in terms of what Michael was saying about the um, parking issues. Council's already done some work and um, I'll be also... Uh, hoping that council and national parks will consult with residents because there's actually already been quite a bit of work um, done on that, particularly around the two picnic areas and um, the picnic area and um, the uh, conservation hut. So, yeah, I think it's a really exciting initiative. Thank you. And Ken, I think. Yes, can I um, just ask you to talk about a very high grade walking track and that's that's great to hear if we call most of the tracks at the moment say a five how would you define the improvement to uh, what you're planning on the grand walk uh, very significant improvement so i would basically if we said some sections of the walk are currently uh, eroded gullies uh, that visitors are walking down looking at their feet the whole time uh, trying not to trip over uh, rocks or slip uh, in the little gullies that they're walking down. And then we're moving to a situation where we're actually going to have a flat, even surface, uh, standardised uh, steps, uh, widths. So it's, in some sections of the pathway, uh, it's actually a, a significant uh, improvement and significant change. Uh, I have got some images I can um, send through from before and after you, if you're interested, but it, generally uh, it's going to be very high standard in the sense that we have Australian walking standards uh, that classify uh, standards of track and the Grand Cliff Bolt Walk will basically be what's called a three. So a one and a two, uh, a one is very easily wheelchair accessible, a two is uh, accessible for varying levels of um, disability focus, and a three uh, is the next tier after that. Thank you. Ken, come up and have a walk around at Wentworth Falls where they've done some of the work already and it's been completed. That'll give you a great idea about what the rest of the walk's going to be like. Yep, uh, I've done that and that okay. was the interest. Um, look, looks fantastic, actually. It's a great job they've done. Thank you. Uh, so just for interest. You're on mute. Who's unmute that? yourself. There you go. It's Keith Ward speaking, Dudley Hearts Rail Museum. I don't I'm not clever enough to put a yellow hand up, so I'm putting a real hand up. Hello, Keith. Hi, how are you? Um the Great North Walk, uh, which has been uh developed heading out of Sydney up the northern beaches and, and further beyond is, is, a, is a mighty project. The concept of a walking trail via Glenbrook Tunnel is probably already being flagged uh, and is well within the parameters of Blue Mountain City Council's bailiwick to uh, be across. Um, with that as a starting point at the eastern end, um, long-term big picture what would be the what would be the possibility of a great western walk from lapston to lithgow incorporating a mix of both suburban bush and cultural um, activities along the way so rather than being a an overnight walk then maybe have a seven-day walk which people can dip into or dip out of as they wish. 
and can bring a level of um, achievement, much in the same as some of the longer walks overseas. Uh, people uh, train for these walks over <laughs> long periods of time so that they can actually perform over, say for instance, a seven day period. So if we have a walking trail uh, proposed and as I understand, fairly well developed the concept of a walking trail from the Glenbrook region. We now have a, uh, a grand clifftop walk at the, somewhere towards the Western end. Um, you know, maybe a big picture, long-term, great West walk. Mm. There's, I know I'm aware that our whole suite of uh, proposals for similar walks, especially from uh, the Nepean through to uh, Mount Victoria and, and Lisco have been raised over the years. Uh, what we're focusing on at the moment with the Grand Clifftop Walk is probably a very different market to uh, those longest multi seven, five day uh, walks. And this would fit into any potential uh, linkage that was developed in the longer term uh, as well from each of those sides. Uh, the Grand Clifftop Walk is probably more at the moment is focused on uh, potentially three days, two nights, uh, or two days, one night uh, with accommodation nights either side as well. Uh, so we'll, I think we'll just be seeing at this stage uh, on a national park perspective uh, that level of focus uh, to begin with. Uh, aside from our existing uh, multi-night, uh, more bush walk experience uh, and uh, remoter. Uh, the park. Mm, thank you. We've probably just got time for two more comments. We'll go to John Cronshaw and then we'll let Andy wrap us up. Thank you, Jason. Sean, uh, over the years we've been concerned about driving your car around the cliff drive and not being able to see the views. And it was discussed at length about view maintenance instead of view clearing some time ago. And the discussion ended up faltering because the council and national parks couldn't agree who owned what trees to clear. So can I just suggest, I can soon dig up that stuff for you, but suggest that while you're doing the maintenance on the walks, which is good, there might be some little um, reference made to clearing views so that people can drive around in their cars, especially people with a disability and can't get out much to have a look at least into the valley views. And there's a number of identified spots between Lura and up to Carl's Lookout that could be quite easily cleared, but it's not the shrubs on the road, which is part of it. It's the 30 foot high trees growing from the valley and it's their tops. And that's where it all faltered some years ago. Okay. Uh, I think we, can, we can look into that a little bit more in conjunction with council. Uh, on the walk and part of where some of these lookouts that we're looking at redeveloping are. Uh, probably the best example also to say is we're very much aware of it. Uh, some of you may have walked sections of the track where there's a sign saying uh, lookout and all you're looking at is uh, a vegetation screen. So uh, we're, we're aware that for this uh, experience to really uh, be the unique experience that it needs to be, uh, we do need to manage the vegeta vegetation and the view. So we're actually looking at having a view management strategy along the whole of the pathway and the whole of the view. Great to hear. Great to hear. Andy. Thanks. Jason, thanks for that. And I'll just make a few really quick points because I'm very aware of time and I'm sure you guys are as well. So um, uh, council and national parks are, are working very well together currently on both the Grand Cliff Top Walk and delivering the Charles Darwin Walk um, improvements and upgrades and, and really are looking at how we can make that an offer to market and to the tourism industry as well. So that's kind of part of the current thinking. Um, Lapston Tunnel, yes, is currently being project managed and we're looking at how we integrate that with the whole of the Eastern Escarpment. And we are working with Penrith City Council particularly about the permeability between the Eastern Escarpment and Penrith and the River Walk in particular. Obviously, longer term aspirations would be connected all up, but that's a, that is a future aspiration, but we'll get there piece by piece. And um, yeah, that's 
really where we're at right now. And uh, so just want to make those points of clarification. Thanks, Andy. And thanks very much, Sean, for the presentation. We'll hand over now to Anthea. Um, and Andy will come back in in the middle of Anthea's presentation as well to learn about how we're going to work with the federal government to spend $2.6 million for the Blue Mountains. Thank you, Jason. Um, thanks for your time today, everyone. Um, we'll run through how the grant works. As Jason said, Andy will pop in to talk about the council-delivered sections of the grant, and then we'll get to questions at the end. So a bit of the basics of today uh, about the grant, the objectives and KPIs that we'll be working towards, the project elements that come under the grant, how the budget works, um, Blue Mountains Tourism's contribution, the timelines, and then a bit of the longer-term strategy that this is, is working towards. So the grant basics. It was awarded as part of the BLURF. The money is for very specific projects as outlined in the grant deed. It's for staffing of those projects, and it's effectively for kick-starting the recovery of the Blue Mountains. We needed to be really clear that it's it's not a substitute for the administration and day-to-day -day running costs of Blue Mountains Tourism. So everybody who is a member and everybody who contributes to, say, the Blue Mountains Tourism newspaper through advertising, it is not a replacement for any of those sources of revenue. It is for very particular activities. Um, and we are going to still need our amazing businesses across the mountains to continue to contribute to, um, to advertising, to putting your businesses on websites. Um, and to contributing even potentially to marketing campaigns um, to, to make sure that we as a collective still all get through this. Um, and this money is to bolster the, the funds that already go into tourism. So the objectives and KPIs that we committed to as part of the grant application were to increase visitation to 4 million people. So that was an increase of about half a million on the post bushfire numbers. Now, of course, we've moved on now to post COVID numbers and visitation currently is zero. So there is gonna be some flexibility in how that is viewed. But at the end of the day, that the base, the base metric that we had to go off at the time because this submission went in in January this year, which we were still, we were still COVID impacted, but not as COVID impacted as we currently are. Uh, within that, extra half a million people, the ex additional tourism or the, the total tourism expenditure for that four million people will, will be about $585 million into our economy here in the Blue Mountains. Again, that's that half a million increase is an increase that's not on there, but that's the total we're, we're aiming for. That does include a per person spend, uh, it's based on mainly domestic because we knew that would who be, who, we knew that was who would be coming. Um, rather than that international spend. We also, as part of the uh, application, said we would deliver two events for the region, um, and I'll talk a bit more about those a little further down, that we would end up with 2,000 industry subscribers. So they are industry subscribers to our newsletter and to our Facebook page, and, and basically giving 2,000 businesses within the Blue Mountains, or individuals if they want to join, um, a voice to communicate with Blue Mountains Tourism through. And then um, the last one is that 20 businesses will complete the Building Better Business or Supporting Tourism Business Program, and that's the one that Council's going to be, to be running. So the specific elements within the project are there's a governance section, because obviously if we're getting um, federal government money, we want to be making sure that we're very clear about how we spend that and that's transparent and there's reporting in place and there's control and oversight over those funds. So that's that first component. Tourism industry communication. So this forum is a perfect example of the sort of tourism industry communications and, and Ellen Hill has put this together for us today. Um, today is funded by Blue Mountain City Council who are looking after Ellen's role at the moment, but that will roll into being done under this grant as we move further forwards. Um, so it is about giving all of industry a voice and the ability to create surveys, to have forums, to have that connection with industry and to really build that strongly over the next two years. The next is a destination marketing campaign that will come on in about November, December this year and roll through until June 2023. I'll talk a bit about more about that in a moment. A destination website up, so upgrade, so that's the Visit Blue Mountains website. And there's a number of elements within that. The destination event that I've already mentioned. Destination branding, so that's another one of councils. 
um, projects and the Building Better Business Program, also as you get further along, called the Tourism Support Program. So project governments, governance. As I said, it's really important that we make sure that the money that needs to be spent during this across this grant is spent well, spent judiciously, um, and has transparency. So Blue Mountains Tourism is the project owner of this grant. Below that will sit a project control group. That project control group um, will have representatives from council and Blue Mountains Tourism on it. And as well as that may well have um, either someone from DNSW or Destination Sydney Surrounds North um, as an external advisor that may come on to that group as well. Below that, um, you will see it splits in two. One side will then look after the council managed projects and the other side will look after the Blue Mountains Tourism managed projects. Uh, we will be bringing on a marketing manager project lead um, to be looking after the Blue Mountains Tourism side. As you can see here in our new resources. So the marketing manager and project lead, and we are interviewing for that at the moment. Uh, and we will have hopefully an announcement in the next couple of weeks around that, which is very exciting. We will also um, be bringing on an events coordinator. Uh, they will be a part-time role with full-time periods leading up to an event and a communications coordinator. And we already have Ellen Hill doing that role, as I said, for um, at the moment funded by council, but that will roll across into the, this grant as we roll through for those two years as well. So firstly, the tourism industry communications. So the objective of this component of the grant is to unify the Blue Mountains tourism industry and to give them one strong collective voice, to provide support to businesses through regular communication, education and networking, and to be able to connect us with people like Renee, who has, is now going to be able to work on business resilience and, and business Blue Mountains. So this is very much about support for the industry as opposed to driving business. This, the key measurables, deliverables against this part of the grant are the recruitment of a communications coordinator. Um, thank you, Ellen, that made our life easy. Um, to create and implement a communications plan and strategy to build resilience and connection across businesses of the Blue Mountains. Deliver an annual program of industry events such as this forum to engage and get feedback. To increase the number of businesses who actively engage and believe that in the tourism industry. So we know that across the Blue Mountains, there are a number of businesses who think, oh, I'm not part of tourism, but I think the bushfires and pandemic has probably proven to them that in fact they are part of tourism because when no tourists come, locals who maybe spend money with them or your b and um, the people who stay in b and who might spend money with them suddenly don't anymore and they, they are part of tourism industry. And so the aim of this is to broaden the net of who believes they are part of tourism in the mountains and to give us all a collective voice as we move through and then assist the industry in delivering an improved visitor experience through education and, and networking. Underneath that, the budget is about 25,500 the first year and 34,500 the second year. That's because the first year it doesn't start until October. Uh, it's about eight grand a month um, to fund that and will run through until June 2023. The destination marketing campaign, the objective not too hard at the moment to rebuild the decimated Blue Mountains visitor economy. So I just wanted to, for a moment, just talk about destination marketing. So destination marketing is about growing visitor and community awareness and demand for a destination in line with our destination brand. It involves clearly and effectively communicating the unique proposition that the Blue Mountains provides, both before visitors arrive and once they're in destination and creating a safe um, sale opportunities for the destination in that process. So there are a few questions filtering through that we've had around dollar for dollar funding. Um, and I'll get to that one. Um, also around how is this going to help my business? And so I want to be really clear that destination marketing is about driving people to the destination at, at a high level. And then underneath that, there will be multiple different ways for small and large businesses to engage with the destination marketing campaign, whether that is through advertising in the Blue Mountains um, tourist magazine, whether that's putting in dollar for dollar as part of um, adding some additional into a marketing campaign. Um, but I, I cannot sit here and promise that every small business in the mountains is going to be included in a high level marketing campaign because it's not what it's about. It's about driving demand. 
And then once that demand is driven and they go to the likes of a DNSW um, Visit New South Wales website or they come to visit Blue Mountains, that your business needs to be there ready, able and waiting. You will be able to, so some of the website updates includes, for example, an itinerary builder. So you want to make sure that you're sitting there in the back end of the itinerary builder so that when someone goes, I'm interested in wellness, that your business comes up. And so it's about understanding where the little jigsaw puzzles of the pieces fit to get your business into the right spot to drive people to your business. It's not about having every business in the Blue Mountains on the billboard that's in Sydney, if that's what happens. So happy to answer more questions about that, but wanted to cover that off at a high level first. So the objectives within the campaign are, firstly, it'll be a 24 month rolling campaign. So there'll be different elements that will probably ramp up pre-peak periods, ramp up before events, um, and then, it, but it will, the idea is that it's always on, as in social is always ticking along in the background. Firstly, we'll have a creative concept confirmation. We do already have the Go Blue um, concept that we used as we came out of bushfires. Uh, it's highly likely that we will pick that up initially because it's already there, ready, the content's there, we might need some new content, but, but that basic creative concept is, concept is there. That doesn't mean it won't evolve and there won't be a new one as we move along, um, but that's highly possibly the one we will use initially. We'll need to procure a media agency, develop content, and I did, there was a question that came to us on will local um, producers, photographers, videographers be able to contribute and uh, we will be going out to tender and absolutely we would be loving to get that money back into the local community. Um, but it will also need to be a competitive tender process because we can't be throwing money away because we need to judiciously spend the money. So it, it's, it's always a balance, but absolutely um, one of our strategies will to be using local talent and skills as much as we can during that campaign. Development of advertising strategy, timeline, budget. So all that still needs to be done. Then obviously need to roll out the strategy. We need to be looking at quarterly results, strategy review, retargeting, changing what we're doing to make sure that we are absolutely spending every dollar to get the most people here to the mountains. So the budget for that is, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, across the 21-22 year, there's $410,000 for that campaign and $20,000 that Blue Mountains Tourism is gonna contribute. And in the 22-23 year, there's $540,000 and another $20,000 that Blue Mountains Tourism will contribute. And as I said, that will run all the way through from November, December when we launch um, through until June 2023. The destination website upgrades. So develop, visit Blue Mountains into a world-class destination website. Our website was built in the last couple of years, I would say on the smell of an oily rag for website budgets, but I think the team did an amazing job with the limited funds that we had to throw at it. Um, the great news is we now have more funds to throw at it, which is excellent. So some of the things we'll be looking at doing as part of that website upgrade is an itinerary planning tool, like I mentioned earlier, integrating social media, content development and blog pages, which then increases our search results, uh, strategies to improve people um, ending up at Visit Blue Mountains. We're going to redesign it to suit Blue Mountains tourism, well, yes, the Blue Mountain, new Blue Mountains brand that Blue Mountains Council is going to be looking after. So that will be phase two that you will see a bit later. Uh, we will also be putting reporting tools in because, again, if we don't understand the analytics of what's happening, then you can't improve it, and that is going to be a really important part of the continually improving our visitor experience on the website and our visitor experience here in the mountains, and obviously reviewing and evaluation. The budget for that is in the 21-22 year, there's $60,000 allocated, and in the 22-23 year, there's $40,000 allocated. The phase one update will occur um, between December and June this coming year, uh, and phase two will then be September through to the following March. Destination event. So to deliver a destination-wide event to boost the visitor economy. So firstly, I don't know what that event's gonna be or what it's gonna look like yet. Um, and we will be working with industry over the next three-ish months probably 
um, to get your input on what we think that should look like. Um, one of the conditions of the grant is also that we work closely with DNSW and we've already had meetings with them. Um, and I know they're really interested in events and, and the sort of, um, and, and partnering on events that we could have up here in the mountains as well. So there's definitely room for people to have input into what this looks like. And I certainly don't have any preconceived ideas about what it's gonna be, but it is for an event. It is for an event in March for the two years. Um, and it's not to fund smaller other events that already exist in the mountains. I know we've lost a lot of events and I know that a lot of events in the mountains are trying to figure out how they're gonna get money to keep, to keep going. Um, I know that DNSW has talked a lot about events. You know, I'm on a weekly um, catch up with DNSW and talk a lot about events. So I would expect, and, and we will be very happy to continue to advocate for event funding to help get our community events back off the ground. But that's not what this is. Uh, so we're gonna research it, figure out what we, what we wanna do, um, create an event project working group to deliver the event carry out the planning, make sure that it's flexible, make sure that it's COVID safe, do whatever we can to deliver it um, as we need to. You know, we all get our jab, then hopefully by March next year, there'll be less lockdowns and we might have to, we, maybe we will have to be less flexible about how events can run. Um, but I think there'll still need to be some serious COVID consideration in it. And then obviously delivering the event and the evaluation. So when I say event, it doesn't have to be, um, the way we pitched it was, it might be a series of smaller events all within the same month. It might be a number of satellites event across, satellite events across the Blue Mountains. It might be one, one thing in one place with, with others and out and around. So it really isn't decided. So when I say event, don't take that as it's a winter magic festival replacement and it's only in Katoomba because that's why it uses the word destination wide, that we, that we do want it to be able to have, have the event have an impact from, from Glenbrook to Mount Victoria. And if we look at the budget for that, we've got $150,000 each year for the planning and delivery of that event. And you can see the timeframes there with the aim to run it in March. Now I'm gonna hand over to Andy. Thanks, Anthea. Um, and if people don't know me, Andy Turner, Manager of the Economy Tourism Place at Blue Mountain City Council. We've been delighted to work with Blue Mountain's Tourism over delivery of um, this grant application and great that we've got the, um, the outcome that we have and we'll work together going forward on, on what that is to deliver. In terms of destination branding, it's a, a bit of a crime that the, the city, the LGA, doesn't have an acknowledged single brand of high quality that we can resonate across a range of platforms. So basically, um, when we were developing the economic development and tourism strategy over the last year, which is a, only recently adopted by council, we, we really wanted to take action on a place brand. That's not just a visitor brand, it's a, van, a brand for investment, it's a brand for council, it's a brand for the whole of the place, but it is also it's a, for people who live, work and invest in the Blue Mountains to take on. Um, so it could be something that's used by local businesses, has real potential for local business to utilize going forward. So it's important that on a global level, we ensure that the Blue Mountains is well recognized and acknowledged and is that destination of choice. So, but as I said before, not simply a visitation brand, also a, um, an investment brand, also a brand for the local government area. In terms of the branding itself, we have completed an audit or just finalizing the completion of the place brand audit. Um, and that really kicks into what we do next, which is basically to write the scope for the development of a place and destination brand. We will be commissioning that in the very near future um, with a view to getting that rolled out towards the back end of this financial year. So we will be engaging many people and many stakeholders in the development of that brand. So we'd like to get to everybody in this Zoom, certainly as part of that process, um, but also far and wide because it's a, uh, it's a long lasting uh, brand. We have many separate and small and niche and individual brands at the moment. This would be a great opportunity to, to formalize a suite of branding for the city. Um, in terms of costings or, or um, the pricing, Anthea, if we move on. Sorry, I can see I've got different screens going here. Um, so in terms of budget, we have $220,000 for this exercise. It sounds like a lot of money in terms of industry parameters and, and benchmarking. 
it's just about enough to get that moving forward. So it's a major exercise with major engagement going forward. So we know as a big exercise to land it towards the back end of this financial year, we need that, um, that level of finance to, to do that exercise properly. So that's the place brand, branding. Um, in terms of the tourism business support program, um, we will clearly, when we applied for this program, we council had been responding to bushfire and um, the COVID situation and has delivered a raft of business supports over the last 12 to 18 months in particular. Um, hopefully many of you have engaged in those processes, either directly or by the mail reference group for business or other channels that we have. Yeah, so we've, We've learned from our delivery of events and, we, um, and, and business trainings, um, particularly things like the Boost with Facebook event, which was only three months ago. It feels like a lifetime away. So we, in shaping this program, were very keen to look at what works and what works well. Now, you've heard from Renee earlier. Um, clearly, there's a need for us to work really closely with Business Blue Mountains, as well as Blue Mountains Tourism, in shaping what we do going forward. We already have an active program with Ecotourism Australia, where we have a number of businesses engaged in that process. So we are looking at how we shape that uh, a, a concise and directed program to a, a, um, a dedicated number of businesses going forward. So we're working on the brief for that now. Um, we'll be offering mentoring, one-to-one -one business supports, workshops, concierge hotlines, a lot of the things that CC corporate community will also be offering. So we, we do need to work very carefully with them when we make those applications, we don't know who's going to um, receive finance. Our package is directed primarily at the tourism industry and is a tourism specific package. So we do need to work out the mapping and gapping in that space and how we work it forward. So that's work in progress right now, but we are in that process and we will get back to you shortly. In terms of budgets, we have $150,000 um, currently to shape a program to deliver through to November 22. So Yep, there's a little bit of time. We, we know business is hurting right now. We want to get these supports right to position business well and particularly tourism business well to respond going forward um, as we emerge from lockdown. Thanks, Anthea. Uh, I did see a question then, why was March chosen for the event? There's a couple of reasons. One is um, traditionally it's a bit of an off month pre-Easter. Um, and secondly, it was practical because we needed, we knew that the grant wouldn't come online until the second half of this year. If we had waited, so we, and, and it takes obviously more than three weeks to put a $150,000 event together. So we knew that we would need a bit of ramp up time to it. So March, as we were coming out of school holidays and we were in that first school term lull, fitted well. Also, we wanted to be able to do two events as part of this program and all of the work has to be done by June 2023. So if we didn't do it in March 2022 and then March 2023 and we'd left it any later than that, we wouldn't have been able to get two events in. So that's the short version of, of why it's sitting in March. Um, the budget, so this is now the overall budget just all pulled together for you. Um, so there's 2.6 million of government funds coming in and then you can see that Blue Mountains Tourism is putting 40,000 cash into the marketing campaign. Blue Mountains City Council is putting 70,000 cash into the brand development and Blue Mountains Tourism also putting 60,000 in kind um, into the campaign. So in total, it's actually nearly $2.8 million in value. So the co-contributions, um, I talked about the 40,000 for um, Blue Mountains Tourism into the advertising campaign earlier. The in-kind is spread across two years and it includes the time of the volunteer committee to manage the grant. It includes accommodation and experience providers providing um, when for meals and events happen. As often happens, we reach out to people in industry and say, can you host media? Can you put people through for free and, and all of that will contribute towards this. So that is a place where we'll be um, asking everyone and businesses across the mountains to help contribute. And all those dollars get counted towards and get put into the reporting so that, it, so that we as the um, Blue Mountains Tourism greater industry are contributing. Um, and also event space discounts for industry forums. And then Blue Mountain City Council are putting in the 70 grand for the brand development. The timeline this slide is busy and I have already gone through the timeline, 
But just so that you can see, it's going to be quite a busy couple of years for Blue Mountains Tourism and for those staff that are developing and implementing all of those strategies. So where does that leave Blue Mountains Tourism? At the end of the day, in, in June 2023, the aim is for Blue Mountains Tourism to, be, to have a really strong base to contribute, to continue on with into the future. Um, and, and hence why right at the beginning I said this isn't about free memberships, it's not about paying for the existing base of, and, and cost base of Blue Mountains Tourism. This is about giving, an giving Blue Mountains Tourism an opportunity to kickstart and drive the visitor economy in the Blue Mountains. And then beyond that, over these next few years, we're going to be building a strategy in the Committee of Blue Mountains Tourism on, on how does Blue Mountains Tourism survive post-grant? Post what are those formal relationships with the MCC and also DNSW look like? How do we build a funding model for the organisation moving forward that, that supports us to be able to continue to drive destination marketing? Um, and, and how do we make sure that we have built that whole of industry engagement and connection? So on to questions. I answered a couple as I was going through. I'm just checking the chat. Thanks, Anthea, and thanks, Andy. Um, we're also just going to put up another survey in Slido on the okay. chat room as well. So if you can have, have a chance to fill that in at some stage. Um, so is there any questions for Andy or Anthea? Annette! Annette. <laughs> you need to unmute, yeah, you Annette. You need to unmute. Annette, you need hey. to unmute. There you go. Couldn't find the right hand, so all I could do was applaud. Um, so <laughs> Yes, my question was about the March thing, and I just said because there is the Blue Mountains Music Festival in March, and there's like the six foot, not six foot track. Um, oh, yeah, six foot track marathon is in March as well, usually the same weekend. Um, and I can see there's Caro and a few others have said in the chat thing. My main thing is that I know throughout this it won't just be we'll get updates on what we're being told what's going to happen, but to be able to input as well. Um, obviously, the committee and the, the, the marketing manager and people will have to. Uh, put it all together and, and, and do the final decisions. But I'm keen for it to be, for it to be about a broader range of reasons to be drawn to the Blue Mountains. Um, school holidays, obviously a peak for a lot of things, but not everybody is a family business. I am now with my full house rentals, um, but walking festivals I can see mentioned in the chat, um, other, you know, adventure sports, cultural thing, reasons to get people up here, not just focused on school holidays and families. So we, we bring people up because people are going to come anyway for then as well, of course, traditionally, but so that it is brought across all the different things that can be done. Like in the magazine, you know, featuring, what was it, thrill seekers, chill seekers and quill seekers. I think there was mention of at the last meeting. Um, so I became just to, and I can see we will get opportunities to promote that it is more than just about family market. Absolutely, and that, and, I, and I think that's that's a really important point. And thank you. I think uh, part of that marketing strategy is absolutely looking at who are the target markets, and and families are certainly a part of that target market and an important one for the mountains. But equally, there's other elements that that need to be focused on. And I think you know Blue Mountains tourism has been very resource challenged in the last couple of years with very limited funds. And I think the great thing about having three three not quite full time resources, two and a half full time resources equivalent is the amount of consultation and engagement that they're going to be able to do because that will be their job, um, to build that strategy, to talk to industry about what's important, to use research to come back and educate our whole of tourism industry in the mountains about well, who are the people who want to come, how can we drive them to come, where are those niche markets we can focus on. And I think you make an excellent point and, and all of that is, is so correct as, as we move forward. We're so excited about being able to do this. <laughs> Yeah, and it is all those little niche, little sideline ones that there hasn't been any. You've got to go for one, and the biggest one is, of course, you know, the most family market. That's right. And I'd just like to also give some praise to the committee that I've had comments in chatting with others um, before this forum and things about that not being told, you know, what to do, but having an input. And I said, look, to be fair, the committee has been doing this for a few years on the smell of an oily rag, and not many people showing up, but many people having opinions. Um, and so to that, you guys have pulled it together and I'd just like to give a bit of praise on that. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Annette. I had to make the decisions because no one's showing up to give their input. So if we all put in, everything raises and we all do well. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Annette. There's a question on the side. When does the new marketing manager come on board? Um, 
we, as I said, we're working through interviews um, and we will be able to make an announcement hopefully very soon. The challenge is, um, as Jason said right at the beginning, we don't actually have the money yet and we haven't signed on the dotted line with um, the regional New South Wales Department to actually get the funds in the bank. It's all been approved and we're just back and forwarding on a few details. Um, and so we can't actually sign that sign our marketing manager on until we actually have a signed deed because from a, again, <laughs> governance point of view, I can't employ someone without having the money to pay them. Um, so it, it does depend on when we get our deed signed with the government, which will hopefully be within the next couple of weeks but not long to go. What I'm going to do now is just wrap up because I understand it's nearly 12 o'clock and some people might have a few commitments they need to go to. So I'll do that, but we're not going to disappear if anybody's still got some questions that you really want to answer. We'll stay here and we can continue answering those, but understand if people have to go, they have to go. We're also just going to put up the last Slido survey as well, which is the third question that we'd like you to answer as well. So on behalf of all the speakers who have come together today, can I say thank you very much for your time to come together. Thanks very much for everybody who's come and attended today. As we've said also, this is, will be the first of a few different events. So we will be able to say, you know, when we're going to talk about specifically when we need input for the event, we'll set out to say whether that's in person or in Zoom um, to be able to have input to that. So you'll be able to be invited and come along specifically for that or for marketing ideas. However that happens into the future, um, we'll keep you all informed for that as well. So do you want to wrap anything up or we just do more sort of questions? Um, more? Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming. Look, I, I mean, it's great. I Please share, like we will have the recording of this. So if you're talking to people who couldn't come, really happy for them and, and we can share the recording with them if they're interested in watching. Um, at the end of the day, the more of us that we can get to meet collectively and to align our voices, the stronger we are going to be with, with when we are trying to advocate with government um, on, on ways that we can help ourselves and that they can help us moving forward. So please, everybody, jump on board. And just the last thing before I go, especially for those people who are new to Blue Mountains Tourism, when we've talked about the committee and the other people involved, it's a, it's a voluntary committee, but it's, so it's Anthea and I. We've also got Stefan. I'm not sure whether you've seen him on the screen. Um, Stefan is our secretary who used to work at the hotel school for a while. Um, he's not there anymore but still volunteering his time to be part of the committee. Evelyn is from Carrara Guesthouse in Katoomba who's our treasurer and also publishes the magazine. Lou at National Parks and Wildlife Service puts in an incredible effort all the time as well for part of the committee. Paul, although he's been travelling and he's on holidays officially, he's been dialling into some meetings um, and he's here today as well. So Paul and Jenny from Shelton Lee, and Paul's been part of the committee for um, as far as I can remember backwards. And then Carol is being, is joined the committee this year officially, but also put in a lot of voluntary time last year. So Carol is the owner of Nepean Bell at Penrith. So thanks very much, um, as Annette has said, and thanks to the committee for everything that you've done so far to help us get to this stage. So thanks for everybody who's come. If you need to go, go. But We'll go back to questions if anybody's got some other questions. Um, we've also got some questions that have been sent in. Um, there's some we've tried to answer. If we get time, I'll answer these. And if, if I don't get to your question here because we've got some more from the floor, I'll respond to these personally as well back via email. So anybody else got some live questions? Michael. Michael Small, yep. So sorry, I'm a bit of a duffer. I, I, I'm finding it hard to see where I answer your survey questions. So there's a link in the chat box. If you scroll up in the chat, there's... Oh, just popped one in there. Um, so if you're in that chat, you can click on that link and that will take you to the survey question. And then every now and then, Andrew flashes up the answers onto the screen. Um, oh, okay, no. Thank you. Rod has a question. Rod Williams, got your hand up. You're on mute, though. Oh, is that any better? Yes, that's much better. Yeah, so good day, Jason. How are you? Good, thanks, Rod. Hey, look, there's a few messages here, and I'm getting a couple. Look, I'm behind this 100%, but there has to be an understanding that for some of us, this is we feel threatened by this. 
And so how do, how do we actually get people like myself and others on board to help drive this? Because a few things for me have come out today that we're not going to be concentrating on all businesses in the mountains. And my business uh, being uh, the other private charter business in this area is under direct threat by something like this. There has to be... I've tried time and time again to work with council, to work with you guys, and to work with everyone in the community just so I can support it and be part of it. Now, th there just needs to be reassurance that this is going to help everybody because... I can tell you I've got quite a few private messages here who are saying, well, hang on, the small businesses are going to get kicked out. I feel that way at the moment. There's no, nobody's going to get kicked out. The way to be part of it, the visitbluemountains.com.au is the website that most of the landing pages will go back to. So anybody who's not on that already, if you can join as a member and you get different levels of being able to do that, you don't have to be a member anymore, and we've sent that information out. Anybody, it's still a cost to do that because it's a cost to load product onto there but anybody can be on that to be included then in when people come to that website and as far as like the concept of what the destination marketing will do there'll be no specific businesses marketed it's like if there's two wineries in Megalong Valley they'll have wine shops to say you can do wine tasting but it's not going to say that it's Dry Ridge Estate or Megalong Creek Estate or the same as it won't mention Fantastic Aussie Tours as a business. It'll At a really high level. Yeah. But then underneath that, there might be opportunities for businesses to contribute to the marketing campaign, and that would, might mean that on social media their business does get highlighted because okay, there are businesses that want to contribute. So it's a bit of a... It's a balance, and it's, it's multi-level. It's not about... Like I said, it's not about every business being in the high-level TV commercial because we can't do that. So it's about finding well, ways for it, every it, business to be able to contribute. You can't have some businesses in high-level TV commercials, as an example, and not others. It is not equitable. Now, I understand your business, for, as an example, is, is an absolute beautiful, wonderful showcase for the Blue Mountains. And, and when I get groups that come up here, I encourage them to come and see you. Uh, you. You help us out with rates to encourage people to get there. For me, I pass those rates on to the public as part of a package. The point being, I do everything I can to support every business I can, but I get the feeling, as lots of people here who are writing at the moment, uh, uh, saying, hey, we're just concerned that there's a maybe not a monopoly. I don't think that's the right term. But I don't feel that this is equitable. This whole thing needed to be done in consultation with lots of other people. I've been trying to join Bermada for a while. I don't mind paying for what I get. I will pay whatever you guys need that I can afford to make all this happen. Not an issue. But at the moment, there is a level of distrust. And I would love to see us all levelled. And everybody, 100% of us all get behind this and make it work. Because I think it's a great platform. But there is an element of distrust and there is an element of feeling left out. Whether you me meant it or not, that's just the reality of it. And there's got to be some way to make sure that doesn't happen. And I, I won't stand by and let some business be on tele ads and not others, for example. Just because it's a small business doesn't mean that it's not their livelihood and it doesn't mean it's not important to our community. I appreciate that, Rod, and I thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and, and as you said it certainly isn't our intention to make anyone feel like that um, I, I think part of this process will be about helping all of our industry across the mountains understand how marketing works and and the best way that we can do that to drive visitation to the mountains and I, I you know I'm not a marketer I'm an engineer um, and but I do believe that there's quite a large education element that we need to work through in the next six to 12 months to help everybody understand how to best get, the, how to get the most for your business out of this. And, and like I said earlier, it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. There's gonna be lots of different places where people can, can, um, can be involved and can get exposure. And, and it's not all about one TV commercial because there's social media and there's, there's a whole raft of places that people can get exposure. And, and it's about helping everybody understand how that is. And it's also very much about us then being able to provide reporting back on how that has helped your business. And, and that's one of the things that the marketing team will be able to do as well. I, so I appreciate what you've said. You're spot on, but look at your Go Blue campaign. 
the amount of distrust and hurt that that caused for some of us, me included. And there's, there's not a little group of us that get together and bad mouth. That's not what it's about. But I'm, I'm just being open and honest. And people will hate me for it. But I'm, I don't stab people in the back. I'd just rather say it how it is and let's work on it. There's a sentiment out there. That was done without... Th there was hardly any opportunity for input for that. I was disgusted by that. I thought it was a great campaign and I thought it looked great. But I, I will put it out there to the business community and I know I'm not the only one who we felt bloody left out and we would really hurt that it all just went ahead and my business it's not as old as other businesses here but i'm still a big part of the community and i still have drivers and i still employ people and we deserve to have at least some sort of input as everyone else should have and that was wrong absolutely and so well, that has to be stopped thanks rod and as I've said, we've now got, we will be bringing on three staff and, and certainly Ellen's role particularly is about industry comms and, and we're aiming to do that. There is a, a question popping up in the chat box about dollar for dollar. So the aim isn't for this to be dollar for dollar. Um, there may be opportunities for people to contribute where they want to contribute if there's, um, if that comes up. So we might be able, we might, we may go out and go, right, the Christmas campaign, we would love to put together some packages. Is there anything anyone wants to contribute? Um, if you'd like your business featured in a particular way on social media, you can contribute to that. Does that mean that your business won't be featured at all? No. Does it mean that you might get a headline rather than a normal allocation of, of number of spots or exposure? Yes, right? And But it's not, this isn't about driving um, and saying that you are only going to be there if you can provide dollars and it's not a dollar for dollar program. Um, so, so just hopefully that helps clarify that. We'll go Annette, Michael and then Keith. Okay, uh, have I got my mic on? I have, hurrah. Um, so just to uh, into that, I get that people think, oh, why can't you be included in everything? It is destination marketing. There is a certain amount of that's, the way it works, and I think I, I stood up at the, the bush, one of the bushfire things afterwards and said, I'm a, I'm little guy. I'm little, hostel, 11 room, not a big business. But I understand that you get what you pay for, and I don't have New South Wales tourism's ear. Jason and Anthea do. And they bring people to the Blue Mountains, and there will be some trickle down. Now, the other thing is, if people are coming to the mountains, I know that my business is full because I do push my own marketing and I have to make decisions and I have to spend some money on it. I made the big decision to go to silver membership for BMT because I thought I've tried a few things and I think it's worth it. And I wanted to put my money where my mouth is with the blue mountains and to work together on it. I have seen an uplift from that. I am very keen to have an input into um, how this money is spent. And as I said before, that it's not just about one group, but finding those other niche markets, which, which with some money and some dedicated staff you will find. Um, it is naive to believe that the big companies will bring people there. You know, Anthony and Jason will be on the news. Now, if they've got bigger PR teams whatever behind them, it doesn't matter. It gets attention to the mountains. But for the representation of the smaller groups, maybe in the ads, if we're doing some filming, it doesn't always have to be. Scenic World's always going to be there. It's, it's, you know, it's a given, not a problem. Um, the big red bus is very recognisable. Okay. But maybe the cafe that's filmed or the hotel room that's filled isn't the Hydro Majestic. Or that there's an alternative one there. Or there's a smaller business. Or maybe we could have some kind of lucky door prize or something that, you know, a little company that doesn't get much attention just gets filmed into part of the, the filming or something. I don't know. Just an idea that maybe that would make you feel there's more of a chance. But otherwise, with the membership thing... You have to make a business decision that you get what you pay for. And if you choose to pay more because you see the benefits are worth it, then that is part of it. So I hope that comes across as supportive, not um, uh, criti criticising people, but also from for Jason and Anthea, maybe just think about that when we are, we have got the filming teams, that it's not always just the, the bigger players, it's some, some small randoms are included. Because part of that kind of small random businesses that we have is part of the charm of the mountains as well, I think. Absolutely. And, and look, I appreciate what Rod's saying. There are 2,000, we think, tourism businesses in the mountains. So obviously I can't, we, we can't get all of those in and out. And, and with the Go Blue campaign, we did try and reach out to a number of small businesses. We had um, Cass, not Cassiopeia, the one at 
um, Mesa Barrio at Lawson. We had double Ristretto in Springwood. We tried to spread them across the mountains. They weren't all Blue Mountains tourism members. Um, there were small businesses. Um, but I would say it depends on which niche you're heading for. Scenic World shouldn't be in every ad because if you're heading for a wellness niche, then Scenic World doesn't fit, right? It is about horses for courses. And so I think that's really important for us to, to try and understand. That's actually the best point Anth, you've just made there. It is, whilst I do say you're the kind of marquee names that will people know, when we are going for those niche people, a lot of people, customers I've had um, previously, they're not gonna go to Scenic World. It's just not their thing. They'd rather walk down into the valley themselves and climb across a rock themselves. Yep. You know, and so that market, no, you won't be leading that ad. That's right, exactly. Um, Keith, you've got your hand up. Maybe you've got a question. Yeah, well, it's more of a, more of a statement actually, but it is sort of a question, I guess. Um, obviously, uh, as the tide comes in, um, the boats rise, and the easiest way to be part of this development and um, confidence that many people have expressed the best way to be part of that is to be on board that boat, right? And if that means becoming a member of, of, uh, of uh, Blue Mountains Tourism, then that's obviously a good way to kickstart that. Uh, not everyone can afford it. Uh, and I guess for a whole variety of reasons, I think you mentioned earlier that there'd be a structure now in the business model for people to sort of be part of it, but not be part of it. And I think that would certainly be welcomed by some of the smaller businesses. Um, with regard to destination marketing, um, m most of you know who've met me will recognise my, my London accent. Um, and London is one of the world's biggest destination markets. Um, and when you see promotions for London, you see Buckingham House, uh, uh, Buckingham Palace, Tower Bridge, the London Eye and Piccadilly Circus. You don't generally see Joe's Cafe and Bill's Bottle Shop because they're not things that are recognised by the sort of people who are going to make London, or in our case, the Blue Mountains, their, their target, uh, their sort of um, the hook, if you like. And therefore, although, yeah, Scenic World and, and, and your um, projects to uh, raise the profile and make, in some respects, Scenic World the, uh, the image of the Blue Mountains is highly successful because there is as Annette said, a trickle-down um, factor here. The more people come to the Blue Mountains, the more, p whether they're drawn in by, by Scenic World or other high-profile um, uh, businesses, it doesn't really matter in the end because the more people that come in, the more people are going to spend money, uh, whether they spend it at Scenic World or whether they spend it with, uh, you know, with our uh, activities or with other activities from all the people who've participated here today. If they're not on the Blue Mountains, they're not going to spend anyway. So how do we get them in? We bring them in with high-profile, with high-profile um, high um, uh, uh, scenes and things that people recognise. So all I wanted to say is if, if you want to be part of it, then, then the option is there for everyone as a business to be involved um, at either a greater or lesser um, uh, degree. And thank you for the presentation. Terrific. Thanks, Thanks Keith. Keith. And Michael, thank small. You. Okay, look, um, thank you everyone for, for putting this together. And can I just share, particularly with Rod and perhaps others who might be feeling, for some reason, a little left out. I've been in business since 1978 as a sole trader, self-employed. And in those 43 years, there have been enormous changes in the photographic industry. Now, I, I see this opportunity that's being presented to us here as a, a, a delightful means of, of, of grabbing what these wonderful people are doing for the region and seeing how we as individual uh, businesses or sole traders can, if, if you like, get on the bandwagon. Now, I've got to change my thinking because for most of the 43 years, the bulk of my business has been weddings and portraiture. I haven't had a wedding to photograph for 19 months because of all of this. And, and portraiture, good heavens, since the invention of digital cameras and, and smartphones, very few people now... Uh, are wanting Weddington portraits. So I, and perhaps others in similar circumstances, have got to 
think, okay, how do I change my business? I've, I've, I've got to change my plans. My intention is to focus more on, you know, the, the, the thousands and thousands of scenic photographs that I've taken and, and get out there and, and market those and, and certainly to, to join Blue Mountains Tourism. But let, let, let's, let's try and be very, very positive about what is happening and what we've learned about in the last two hours or so and see how we can adapt our perspective to participate in the success that this is going to bring. Thanks, Michael. Cool. And Rod Williams, have you got your hand up again? Rod? Yeah, Jason. No, it's all good, mate. Okay. Um, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Um, I, I was still having a conversation with Anthea and it, it got keen, so I'll talk later. Okay. Um, a couple of questions we've had from the past um, that were written in. To what extent are future, future strategies embracing new digital media technologies? Of course, you know, we're looking at that all the time and before we do anything and the new marketing manager, when they come on time, we'll be making sure that we're dealing with the latest and the greatest technologies that are out there. Um, I think we've covered the dollar for dollar. Um, there's a question, is there any data that shows there would be visitor interest in a zero carbon gateways? Um, not, it's a great question. Um, we need to look into it further. But of course, you know, there's a number of businesses here that are on the sustainability path. Um, we've got a lot of businesses that have gone carbon neutral. There's also the ecotourism is working with Blue Mountain City Council now, and there's some businesses here already that are ecotourism accredited. So through Blue Mountain City Council, and you can reach out to Justine, there's the opportunity for some businesses to be able to um, join that program as well. Um, many councils worldwide are keen investors in tourism. How much support does BMCC provide to tourism in the Blue Mountains? So over the years, Blue Mountain City Council has always supported tourism with the visitors' information centres. Well, since they were taken over by council after the industry had them years ago, back in your grandfather's day. But so Blue Mountain City Council has always been involved in tourism, and that's been up and down over the years as well. But the VIX have already been part, has been part of that. Different years, they've spent different amounts of money. They used to fund BMLOT significantly. They do support Blue Mountains Tourism on a project by project basis. And we certainly had our ups and downs over the years with council as well. But I can say really that the relationship we've got now with the council as the best it's been in decades. So we're looking forward to continuing to strengthen that relationship as well. So very supportive and, and working well together for the industry going forwards. Um, National Parks plans for Govett Sleep and have they eliminated parking except for disabled parking? Um, the, I checked with National Parks. There's been um, work on that, but it's definitely not the elimination of parking besides disabled parking. Um, and you can reach out to National Parks directly if you need more specifically information on that. Um, what is being done for small retail and hospitality businesses and how will the spending of the $2.6 million bushfire grant result in more revenue for my business? Really two similar questions, but I think we've sort of covered that, that um, as Keith pointed out, the rising tide will lift all boats. So we can generate and get more visitors to come back to the Blue Mountains. That's going to benefit everybody. Um, there's a couple of questions too about the process and timing of the applications for grants um, and the criteria for funding ev of events. So I think Anthea has covered on that, that the money that we've got is specifically already been allocated. There's some flexibility in how that's spent, but it's not designed to be a dollar for dollar campaign or to then go to anything else that's in the Grand market fund in, in other place. events, yeah. So there is other things that are always coming out of Destination New South Wales, and I'm sure it's not the last of the grants that will come from them. So as more information comes on that might benefit other events that are already in existence, we'll certainly feed that through um, if that comes from TA or from Destination New South Wales. Um, so I'm pretty sure that covered the questions that were sent in prior. Um, if I've missed any of those, please reach out again and we can certainly talk more or answer questions. Um, well, there's been some number of things through the chat as well, so we'll just double check that, that that was all covered and that you're happy with that, and if not, come back to you one-on-one. -on -one. So thanks very much for coming, attending, and um, we'll be in touch again. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon.